Hello, and welcome to the Mystical Archive. And today we're joined by fantasy artist Phil Stone. Phil has made some amazing art for a lot of different projects uh, with Wizards of the Coast, Legendary Gaming, Bloat Games, and many others. Um, today we're going to talk through a couple of different things. And typically for this channel, we're looking through the lens of Magic the Gathering, but I want to expand that a little bit and talk about art in general, talk about Phil's process, and really just kind of get into some fun questions. So, Phil, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, the first thing I really wanted to talk about is your background, how you got into art, um, what really inspired you to start doing this, and a little bit of your journey to where you are now. That's a two-day story. <laughs> um, <laughs> my, well, I mean, I've been drawing since I can remember. I could hold a pencil. But, you know, it gets to a certain point. A lot of kids are like that. says drawing is just a natural thing. Um, and it gets to a point where all of a sudden you're like, you stick with it. Well, well, with some individuals, it just, it just drops off and it was just a thing. Um, my, I, I don't know if you would call it like a, like an enlightenment kind of thing or a moment of clarity, uh, was during the satanic panic, um, in 82, a bunch of older guys introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons and I was not a smart kid. I was also way too young to, uh, even be playing that game because it, it involved, math and all that kind of good stuff. Oh, yeah. so, but the thing that, that resonated with me was uh, the artwork and the black and white artwork. And I fell in love with it. And I lived out in the middle of nowhere um, where a trip to the mall was like once a month. And after I got introduced to that, I would beg my mom to, you know, take me to the store. I want to go to the toy store and get Dungeons and Dragons. So I had all the books, but I had nobody to play with. I lived yep. in the woods. And, um, but I wanted it for the artwork. And I would sit there and try to mimic like Errol Otis or Easley or anything and all of those guys and um, and try to mimic them and, and draw the little monsters and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it was during the satanic panic and my parents were very religious and the church one day, the pastor brought it up about, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and this and that. My mom came home and she was like, that's what that game's about. <laughs> so into the fire pit they went into the burn pile and she burnt all my books and my dad and i still do not understand his logic to this day decided to make me feel better and gave me a pile of uh warren publishing magazines of creepy and eerie and vampirella from the 60s and okay. the 70s and he goes you know we just have these you know you want to read some stuff and look at monsters it was worse than Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, I mean, <laughs> so my my the thing that really sealed the deal was, and I still have the copy at home. It's the only surviving comic book that I had from my youth. Was creepy issue whatever, but it had Bernie Wrightson illustrating uh, the Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat. Okay, and that's what sealed the deal. Not only did I want to draw for a living, but I wanted to draw like Bernie Wrightson. And still to this day, Bernie Bernie haunts me in my dreams. <laughs> It's because it's like, how did he do that? So anyway, that's and then when high school hit, I mean, you know, I lived out in the woods and there was no art classes, really. No. They had like one commercial art class where you would like, I don't know, learn how to make a business card. And then the other art class was let's draw an apple for the entire semester. And um, that's a project. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's when I got into I mean, I just all I wanted to do was was draw a picture. I wanted to uh, draw Spider-Man. All right. Very cool. And I thought when I turned 18 years old, Marvel was going to come knocking on my door <laughs> and they're going to say, we found you. You're going to draw Spider-Man for us. And it doesn't work that way. No. Um, <laughs> not. But that that whole catalyst of between Dungeons and Dragons and Creepy and, and Warren Publishing was what really sealed the deal. And where most kids, you know, just stopped drawing and it was just a thing. It just it just drove me. Got it. I mean, that's very cool. So, so two parts to that. One, I completely feel you on, uh, you know, people get into things and then they fall out of them. Yeah. And I myself, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none type right. of guy. I'm like marginally good at a lot of different things, but never pour myself fully into to one thing. And I remember spending a lot of time like loving art and I, I appreciate art mm -hmm. on, a, on a level. And, you know, I have a bunch of art hanging up at home that people come over and they're like, what is this stuff? And, you know, it's like magic art, fantasy right. art, different things like that. Um, 
But when we think about that, there's a lot of different mediums that you can work in in fantasy art, right? Mm -hmm. You have illustration, you have, you know, charcoal drawings, you have full color, you have these crazy computer generated, right. you know, video game, yeah, yeah, 40, like yeah, amazing pieces of art for you. Um, obviously, you like to do the black and white type yeah. of art. What's your favorite medium to really do that in if you had a choice? I know most most of everything today is digital. Yeah, uh, for a good reason. But if you had a personal project that you were working on that wasn't digital, what would you prefer to work in? Pen and ink. Pen and ink. Um, the reason I switched over to digital, no, my my career went in two parts. Um, I'm a failed comic artist in the '90s um, for ten years, just a complete failure. I got a second chance at art, and I taught myself digital because. And I'm glad I did because the workflow that comes through um, and the payment you don't get for a lot of the drawings, you have, to, I mean, especially with corrections, you know, with paper, you got to go through and you're either going to white out some of your inks or, or readjust the pencils. And it's time consuming. So with digital, it's a lot easier to have a workflow. I mean, I work for 12 other um, small presses, including, you know, not, not including Wizards of the Coast. And so when I'm working during the day, I work 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and I have to do at least five to six pieces a day to keep up with the workflow and digital, digital, digital just makes it happen. But the one thing I noticed, um, I spent a lot of time on the, um, on the tools for the pen tools and trying to get just messing with them, trying to get that bleed yep. that you would get off of a, off of a traditional pen. So when they get printed out into a print, um, especially on watercolor paper, it looks beautiful. Yeah. It, it, it looks legit. It doesn't look like, oh, it's a, you know, digital drawing. No, for so, sure. I like digital, but if I had my choice and the pay was there, I'd, I'd go back to pen and paper in a, in a heartbeat. Okay. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I, I know for me, um, I, I love doing charcoal drawings. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd find like some gnarly tree out in the woods, go sketch that or like a decrepit old like retaining wall that was falling right. apart i love like those nature scenes mm -hmm. uh, but it reminds me of like you know like that house in the woods it's been abandoned yep. you're not sure if there's ghosts in there that kind of it's thing. all like gritty that's... and worn and, and there's textures and, and oh, that's yeah. what's beautiful thing about charcoal too is you can get those textures in there absolutely but yeah you were mentioning too when you're using like a digital drawing tablet there's that issue of parallax between the screen and the pen right so you it, you gotta calibrate it right to make it feel yeah. right otherwise you're gonna you're going to start drawing. The lines aren't going to line up the way you want. It's not going to look the way you want. And it really does take a little bit of finesse to, to get those tools to your style. Right. Um, those are really cool. Um, if anybody out there is an artist and thinking about it, use those. They're amazing. Um, and they're actually reasonably affordable nowadays, um, unless you want to get the big giant, you know. Well, I got a, I got a 32 inch. I work off of a 32 inch um, Huion. Okay. Um, that was that was a bit pricey. But I, I worked up to that. But my, my first big tablet was a 19-inch Huion. I think I got that for 450 bucks, And then the, the program came with it for free. But, um, yeah, after Watsy took off with me, I was like, I got I to gotta up my game. Because the one thing you can do with digital that, that traditional kind of lacks in is I can, I can get in there, say, um, uh, my Nadar drawing. Yeah. Okay. There's so much filigree in that armor. That you can't replicate it unless I Expand unless I had it. Zoom it in. Yep. But if I was doing it on paper, this thing would have to be canvas size, huge. But I can get in there, and that's what you know. I picked up a lot of other presses um, because I was delivering a lot more detail. They were getting more bang for their buck. So that's just kind of how I made my name amongst those uh, the RPGs there. Awesome. So what would you consider your first professional project that you worked on that really took off? Well, the first time nothing took off. <laughs> well, it's one of those tracks. The only guys. thing that yeah. took off was me on a Greyhound bus back to Detroit for California. <laughs> but we'll, get, we'll get into that yeah. in a few minutes. But, but. I, I guess my personal project was my, um, when I started out, I had enough money in the bank to last me and my, my, my kid was going to MSU at the time. I had enough money in the bank to last us six months. So I had to make it happen in five before I started applying to Amazon or be a fry cook down at uh, Wendy's. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I applied all the wrong ways, just like I did the first time and um, picked up a couple of jobs. I've been, I've been illustrating for N-World. 
for I'm going on nine years now with N World, and they were my first gig. Um, once you get one thing published, it's easier to get into the doors, especially with somebody Absolutely. like N World. Um, you just gotta have one person like you, and they they vouch for you. So I wanted to start doing Kickstarters, and I wanted to start doing my own thing, and I was like, well, I'm gonna do what everybody else is doing and do a module. I failed miserably. It was, I think I made $700 off of that, this module. And most of it was my mom's money. And I was like, okay, well, that's an oversaturated market. So then I had to dig back to what, what would 10 year old Phil want? So I decided I was going to, I was going to take on this project and it was going to take a few years. Um, I decided to illustrate all eight schools of magic in grimoire form for 5e. Okay. So if you were playing a wizard or a sorcerer or whatever, you would have this like really cool grimoire with your little spell book and each spell was illustrated and stuff like that. That thing blew up. My, it was right after I did this dumb little module, which I liked it. Um, <laughs> Wasn't that the bane of artists? You work on what you want and not everybody else always likes it. It was sometimes. a cool little storyline about little Bento the goblin trying to get through the woods okay. and discovered religion, but it really wasn't. It was actually a demon living under his, you know, <laughs> and you had to, as adventurers, you had to convince little Bento that you're not part of a religion. You're actually, you're possessed. And <laughs> so anyway, uh, the first one came out was necromancy. Um, and I think it did almost eight grand okay. on the first one. And then I did all eight. And then after those eight, I put them in huge eight and a half by 11 leather bound tomb forms and ended up doing like 30 grand on the, on the final one. But that was after 10 Kickstarters Okay, that I just developed that audience. I had a black, it was 400 pages for each tomb. So it was 800 pages total of art <laughs> in three and a half years. And then I decided I'm going to do a demonology book with all the demons of 5e and make it into a legit grim. I wanted to bring back the satanic panic. Yeah. So I dug up old manuscripts from the 13th century and 12th century of, uh, you know, Goetia and King James the first with the demonology and just started incorporating all of that into the demonology book. And that was fun. And yeah. that, that, but that, yeah, it was, it was the, it was the spell books that really took off um, kind of what I'm known for. Yeah, and if anybody wants to check, you can find online like that. They are beautiful. I've seen them, um, and they look really amazing. Um, really cool pieces of art, and like when you add that extra element of having yeah. them like leather bound, and you have this physical item, it really makes it pop in a way that like it takes you to that place. Yes, and it's really encapsulating. It's really amazing. That's why I wanted some kind of like really cool peripheral to make it more immersive into the game. And then, you know, that's what I wanted when I was a kid. I was like, I want, I want a spell book and I want, you know, like Tom Hanks in Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> he had that little pouch with his little spells in it. I was like, I want that too. <laughs> so when it comes to things like uh, D&D, is that something that you uh, spent some time playing? I did. Okay. Um, I finally, uh, later on in life, finally actually got to play a game. Um, and it wasn't until three... It was, th uh, yes, third or, th yeah, it was three was my first game. Okay. And, um, I mean, I had all the stuff, it comes back in and in and out of your life and stuff. It's always been a huge, you know, influence or whatever, but yeah. And I started playing that. I ended up opening a game store and that's how I got really heavy back into it. And that was with fifth edition. And, um, that's why I, um, just had a blast with it, but now it, it's crazy. I, just, I can't get a game in to save my life. Yeah, that, that's how it goes. <coughs> you know, unfortunately, you get play groups that can't meet and they can't do all that kind of stuff and just becomes chaotic. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that I have fond memories of being a teenager, playing d d in my basement, blasting like crazy metal music yep. with my friends and just really diving into it. And it went one of two ways. Either we were going to play it straight or we were just going to go off the rails yeah. and everything was going to get crazy. Total, total murder hobo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, which both are fun and both are right. a good place. Uh, but everybody's got that one person in the group that takes it too far. Yes. And we had a we had a buddy and he just decided no matter what, he was just going to rape and pillage. And that was his character. But, hey, he played it well. So yeah. that's my kid who played all of a sudden turned who was a paladin. And he turned into an anti-paladin real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you had mentioned about, um, you know, spending some time out in California and then coming back to Detroit. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like that experience, what you were pursuing and kind of how that shaped and formed, you know, the later years of your life? So what happened was California was the end game. That was that was where it was just done. Um, when I was in high school, 
was my, 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 my favorite anecdote about how brutal the comic book industry was back then. And we're talking, this was 1990 um, when I got my driver's license and I was working at a local comic book store um, because we had moved from Armada back over to Romeo. I got kicked out of both school systems in Armada, so we had to move to Romeo. (laughs) And uh, they're having to be this like makeshift comic book store. And somebody said, hey, there's a Marvel artist that lives two or three towns down the street and you should go talk to him. And I was like, well, hot damn. Yeah, yeah. Got off of work, rode my skateboard back home, got into the phone book. I stalked this guy. He had a very uh, unique last name, so he's easy to find. After dinner, I cold called him, introduced myself, and I said, I want to be a Marvel artist. Will you look at my portfolio? He said, yeah, come on over tonight. Now, mind you, my dad was a detective at the time. <laughs> and I'm going... <laughs> And I'm going to a stranger's house in the woods, three towns over at night. And he was like, yeah, go ahead and go, you know, <laughs> be an empty, text your sister, will be empty nesters by tomorrow. Oh, and, it was a different time. <laughs> yeah, it was a totally different time. My dad's like, yeah, whatever, just be back by 11. Okay, cool. So I go to this guy. He, he was known for um, the Punisher War Journal, and but mostly he was known for the Savage Sword of Conan. Okay. Black and white, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And I went to his house with my portfolio. Now, keep in mind, nobody showed me how to put a portfolio together. It was literally some faux leather portfolio my parents bought me for Christmas to make me feel good about myself. And I put my little scraps of paper in there because nobody shows you how to do this. You know, there was no internet. And God forbid I walk into a library. And um, so I show up at this guy's house with my little scraps of paper. And it was this beautiful Victorian house in the woods. And uh, he takes me upstairs to his studio. It was the studio I wanted. It was an attic of his house. All the references up there. It's all Conan. You know, it was just, this is what I wanted. He was a traditional black and white artist. And he goes, let me see your portfolio. So he starts flipping through it. And there's little pieces of paper. He's just Shit flying everywhere. Just, yeah. And he's just like, he puts it all back as best he could. And he hands it back. He goes, I don't know what the hell I just looked at. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much I can swear on this thing, but oh, it's fine. Okay, yeah, first couple. He goes, I don't know what the fuck I just looked at, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" I thought this was my way out. He's gonna be like, "Take my job, Phil." No, he didn't. <laughs> he was like, "This is the worst stuff I've ever seen in my life. You are wasting my time." He goes, "I don't, I don't know what to tell you." He goes, "Do you want to be something else in life?" And I was like, "No, I want to draw comic books." He goes, mm, "That ain't gonna happen." And um, so oh, now I'm completely man. crushed at this point, and he was like. I don't know. He goes, do you have an anatomy book? I go, yeah. He goes, did you open it? <laughs> just berating me for a half hour. I'm just absolutely crushed. And he goes, look, I spent enough time. I got to go back to work. Um, the only advice I can tell you is if you don't take your car and wrap it around a tree in a suicidal rage tonight, you might do something with your art. So that was my introduction into my first portfolio showing. And it got worse after that because I'd go to comic cons mm-hmm. Um, I would do submissions and stuff like that. Well, my parents wouldn't let me go to art school. So I had to go to a traditional university and I was a history major and I hated it. I got thrown out of there after the, after two years and then just kept submitting and going to comic cons and stuff like that. And finally there used to be a, there used to be a book. It's like a long winded story, but there used to be a book, um, called artist market. I think it's still out there. That's how you did your submissions. And it would go in like graphic design or comics or magazines and stuff. It was all, it was all sub um, chaptered. So I used to have a stack over the years because I was living in, I don't know how many punk rock communes. <laughs> just, <laughs> just living the life of a dirt bag after I got thrown out of college at, you know, 20 years old. And uh, one guy gets a hold of me and he was like, Hey, is this Phil? And I said, yeah, he called me on the phone. I was all excited. This is my big ticket. He goes, I just want to tell you, you know, you suck. <laughs> and I was like, okay. He goes, but I can help you. This time I'm living in like the fourth punk rock house with a bunch of people. Just, just, I'm like, I, it's got to happen. Time to change the time to change. Here. So he goes, I'm going to teach you how to draw with the phone. And I was right. like, <laughs> okay. So he was like, you got like a drugstore by you? I said, yeah. He goes, I want you to go down there. Why don't you get some coloring books? And I said, all right. He goes, I want you to trace all that shit. <laughs> figure out line work. Figure out weights that way. I'm like, okay. So I, and he goes, and send them to me. <laughs> I was like, all right. So I sent them to him. Then we go back and forth. 
over the phone. He's trying to teach me how to draw. Meanwhile, I'm still submitting. The best rejection I ever got, and this is my other favorite anecdote, was um, Dark Horse Comics. Yep. I love Dark Horse Comics. Still to this day, even though after what happened, the the editor and owner at the time, I can't remember his name. He had that white hair. Um, I think he's dead now. Yeah, it doesn't pop in my head. Anyway, he um he he hated me so much that he got a typewriter. Because we we used to make fun, we used to do drunken readings of all my rejection letters. Because he's he, he just going to put a gun in your mouth. Well, yeah, I mean, and, <laughs> that's a good alternative, but it also sounds like a great time. Right? Oh, it was, a, it was a riot, and this one was our favorite one because my buddy always wanted to read it because he was like the death metal kid. So he had gotten a typewriter, put the letterhead in there from Dark Horse Comics, and he and he took the time to write trash, 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 pulled it out, signed it with a pen. Put it in the, into an envelope with a stamp and hand mailed it. That's how much this man hated my work. And yeah, my 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 buddy, the death metal kid, he'd be like, "Hey Phil, guess what?" I go, "What?" He go, "Trash, trash, trash," <laughs> <laughs> and we just lose oh, it. But anyway, uh, long story short, um, he, the the guy from California, Craig Storman from Blue Comet Press, he's dead now. Um, he dead a while ago. Um, I was surprised he didn't die sooner, but um. He calls me up and he goes, I want to give you a 10 page cameo in it was death something death. I don't know. Everything had death in the name in, of in the nineties. Absolutely. So anyway, I, I, this is it. This is my ticket out of here. I'm, I'm big time. So I do this 10 page thing, send it in like with, a week later, he calls me up and I thought like it already got printed. He goes, why don't you come out to the alternative press conference in, in San Jose with me and work the booth with me? I was like, well, hot damn, yeah, there we absolutely. go. I had not a dollar to my name. I, he goes, yeah, you got to pay your own way, though. Okay. Figure that one out. Yeah. yeah. So I begged, borrowed, and stole, called my mom, borrowed 800 bucks off her to get a flight to L.A. Dude picks me up in a beat-up Fiat. <laughs> <laughs> He's living the big life. No. Um this, the the office was supposed to be in Redondo Beach. And so he takes me, he goes, we got to stop at the office first. And I was like, oh, sweet. This is going to be freaking awesome. No, it wasn't. It was his parents' house <laughs> from the 60s in his original bedroom as a kid. This dude was like, I think he was like 50-something at the time. Still living his, running this thing out of... I was like, okay. So again, if we had the internet, I could be like, mm, he's not yeah. legit. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, we go to the alternative press conference and um, no, it's called Ape Alternative Press Expo. He just kept handing me hands of pills. <laughs> he handed me a hand of pills when I got off the plane, got in the car, hand of pills. So I'm like, all right, well, at least case, worst case scenario, I'm getting free drugs out of this shit. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of it, what happened there. But when we got there, I thought I was going to see my stuff in print. No. And he goes, oh, no, it was trash. I didn't print that. I just figured you'd come here and hang out with me. And I'm like, I borrowed $800 for yeah. my mom to come here to hang out with me. Well, I'm getting free drugs, but I can't tell him on that. And um, so anyway, went back home, completely crushed again. And I was still submitting and uh, working just the horrible jobs. And... Um, Finally, he goes, uh, me and my that death metal kid, I, his name was Simon. Um, we came up with a couple of books on our own. So I was like, I want to mail them off to Craig, see if he'll, he'll publish them. Because he's the only one who will talk to me. He's like that one thread. It's like, just keep, I just want to get a foot somewhere in, or at least a toe in the door. <laughs> so he goes, oh, I love this stuff. Blah, blah, blah. When can you come to California? I'm like, I can be there. Whenever you need me. Give me a week. Yep. Me. Simon and he was dating my sister at the time spent our last dollars getting a budget truck. We had nothing. And we drove that thing three days cross country. It was a miserable experience. Got there, lived in orange Grove in a guest house. And I was, yeah, it was, it was a nightmare. And we started, you know, just pumping out work. And he's not paying. And so I was like, okay, well, now everybody's disappointed, crushed again. But I'm like, no, this is gonna this is gonna happen. Long story short, this went on for about a year. And I'm working at some place called the G Spot. My buddy Simon, he was he was pumping out uh Porta Johns on the military base in Oceanside. 
And uh, he couldn't take any more. He, he was like, screw this. This is dumb. Six no. months in. I, I lasted almost a year. And um, one night, well, one morning, four o'clock in the morning, Craig calls me up and he goes, he's screaming his head off. I go, what are you doing? Because I shot my foot off. I said, how'd you shoot your foot off? I was aiming for my head. So I'm trying to do math. <laughs> how that works, how, right? Uh, yeah, the trajectory. And uh, I was like, you know what, Greg? I said, call 911. I'm done, dude. I, you yep. know, this and that. And the only thing I got out of the whole thing was a cocaine habit, alcoholism. And uh, the the bar I worked at, um, the owner just watched me just go into a downward spiral that was just just miserable. So dude goes, uh, you're done. I go, what do you mean I'm done? Am I fired? He goes, no, 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 no. You need to get out of the state. He goes, I got you a Greyhound ticket. Here's a carton of smokes. Here's 50 bucks. It was the same amount of money I landed in California. I had $50 in my name when I landed in California. <laughs> and uh, he got me drunk and put me on the Greyhound and sent me home. And I got I went straight into rehab after that. And then, um, yeah, I ended up living in a, 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 a attic of a farmhouse in Shelby Township. And uh, ended up becoming a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely not a linear path, right? No, no. Um, so I got a fun anecdote to share with you. Um, I, too, am very uh, proficient when it comes to doing hair. Right. Uh, so my grandmother owned her own uh, beauty parlor mm-hmm. when I was growing up, and I was the test subject for That's everything. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, I have a daughter now, and right. it's great. So, like, in the morning before school, I'm in there, like, braiding her hair. I kind of yeah. cut my wife's hair and everything, and everybody, like, they look at me, and they're like, what? Right. It makes no sense. So I feel you on that piece, right? Like you learn a skill, you, you it becomes something that's also useful. Yep. Um, because for me, like I don't, I lost all my hair, so right. I'm, I'm good. I can just work on other people now and not worry about myself. Um, but I did have one other thing that I wanted to mention um, in regard to, and I think this is funny to something that you said earlier, you were talking to that Marvel artist and he asked you if you had an anatomy book. Yeah. I would challenge a lot of Marvel artists in the nineties if they had an anatomy oh, book as well. Oh, felt couldn't drop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Muscles in places that don't exist. So... <laughs> Liefeld, uh, Eric Larson, yep. uh, any, any of the image guys. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I think, you know, my experience with comic books that I really loved was like seventies, eighties, nineties, X-Men. Yep. And like that era, as you get closer into that nineties, the early to mid nineties, just rip dudes that no, no possible way. No. And then you're trying to like, you know, feather in shading in there and stuff like it just became those really just sharp lines that mm-hmm. didn't make any sense whatsoever. But but yeah, my, my, my grandma was a hairdresser who trained my mom and my mom was the one who came to me in the attic and goes, you, there's nothing going on in your life right now. You should be a hairdresser. Better than nothing. And I was like, I really don't want to. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try it just one more time. This is a 10 year run yep. that I would, I've been submitting and just failed miserably. I started when I was 16 and then when I was 26, uh, or 20, yeah, I was 26. My mom was like, you, you got it. So she took me to a hair show and uh, there was a company called Rusk, R-U-S-K. And that was her favorite, her favorite company. So we're watching them and they're doing like, you know, I'm watching the owner, Irvin, like doing these really cool platinum mohawks in front of like giant screens playing anime. And I was like, <laughs> if I'm going to do it, I want to do that. And I did do a two year apprenticeship um, to be a hairdresser. Six months in, I didn't know what I was doing, but I found out there was a trial, like a Try not a tryout, but an interview type mm-hmm. deal for Rusk, and it was up in Ann Arbor. So I'm like, I'm gonna go up there. I'm almost like, you gotta have your license for at least two years. I said, No, nah, I'm gonna show them what it's all about. Hold my beer. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna bullshit my way into this one, and I did. Nice. And I bullshit my way into the actual physical tryout, where I didn't realize that that once you tried out, they threw you up on stage in front of hundreds of hairdressers. And you're doing classes in salons. I thought I was, I don't know what the job was actually. So anyway, I, I finally made it through the, the trial. And after failing the first time, and uh, they found out I could speak. And uh, next thing you know, I'm not even licensed. I'm still going through my apprenticeship. And I'm traveling the world um, every weekend. <laughs> getting up on stage in front of, you know, hundreds of hairdressers doing the show. And then, uh, yeah, the company was a little upset when they found out I didn't have a license. <laughs> imagine, imagine some liability tied to that. So, well, well, when you cross state lines, your license isn't worth anything. Yeah. And especially when I went overseas, I was in England, I, you know, every, every few months and your stuff was not valid there. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. I did that for 20 years. 
That's a, a very interesting turn of events, right? Oh, it's a huge turn, but it was it wasn't until I mean, in that period period of time during that twenty years, I I, I owned a, uh, a few salons. My first two failed. Um, third one was rocking, and then I owned a game store, and it was just like. I, I guess I was looking for something and then um, lupus kicked in and um, I couldn't do hair anymore. And um, yeah. And my, my, my wife was, my wife was like, try hard again. And I was like, you kidding? I got one <laughs> client that I just dick around with. I do like two little quarter page color drawings for N world just to make my kid think I'm cool or something. And uh, so, yeah, that's, what I said when I had, I had six months worth of bills in there and uh Within six months of doing it, I accumulated 12, 12 publishers. And all of a sudden, one morning, um, I'm checking my email off my website, and there's a job offer from WOTC. And I never applied to them. Never thought I was good enough. I'm a black and white artist. Why would I even apply to WOTC? No. You know, but all of a sudden, they were like, I thought it was a joke. Because I picked up a mentor on the way, too, and he liked to play jokes on me. And so my response to Watsi's offer was, who the fuck is this? <laughs> and they wrote back. They're like, no, this is legit and blah, blah, blah. No. And, yeah, that was within within six months. So, I mean, you kind of go full circle. When I was 18, I thought Marvel was going to come knocking on the door, but Watsi beat him to it. So <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> ended up working with somebody. And, it, you know, it's one of those things that it's, it's about the perseverance. And, yeah. you, you know, if it's something that you love. And it's something that you enjoy doing. Right. It's better if it comes naturally than forcing your way into the door. Like you, you were doing something that you really like doing. Right. People took notice of it and they said, Hey, we're going to give this guy a chance. And now it's kind of, you know, turned into something else. And now you're doing it full time. Yeah. Um, it, it's a living. And October 1st is my four year anniversary of, of going straight into full time. Four years. That was it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a great story in, in terms of where you started kind of like that weird middle period where most people think it's like you said, linear, where right. no, you're all over the place. <laughs> and then you circle back around to the beginning in a way yep. where now you're doing the thing that you wanted to do that was, you were inspired by as a kid, because you know, a lot of the art that you're providing for Watsi is all based around D and D, right? So it's adventures in the forgotten realms, battle for Baldur's gate. You have some other projects that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And, um, for, for a look for little kid, Phil. Yeah. It's, oh, the dream come true. Exactly. And I got to work with the guys who inspired me. Yep. When I found out in Forgotten Realms, I was working with Easley and, and Jeff D and Errol Otis. I, I, if my wife had 10 TVs on at the same time watching uh, The Notebook, the, the magnitude of that ugly cry times 10, that's exactly what happened when I, when they, because they never tell you what it's for. No. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, it's just going to, I don't know what this is for. It's awesome. I'm, this, this is a dream come true, but it's probably going to end up on some birthday napkin wiping off little Jimmy's cake <laughs> off his face, you know, but then they finally halfway through the project because they just kept giving me cards yeah. and I ended up with eight and forgotten realms. And, um, then they finally told me what it was and I lost, I lost my shit. And I was like, this is it. And I find out who I'm working with and stuff like that. So I started reaching out and, and got to talk to some of these guys and I'm like, this is insane. You know? So then when Baldur's gate came out, um, I thought that was it, just the eight cards. Well, all of a sudden I got, you know, contacted again. And then I'm like, I ended up doing 11 cards in that set. I thought it was 13. Um, but the other two were in the Beatles and Grimm, mm -hmm. um, drop. Well, they made that, my dragon into that pewter thing. Yep. And then I have two more coming out in 2023. Um, and I, I don't know if was are just going to do any more, uh, with the black and white. I'm pretty sure they will going off the sales. Yeah. So I think after this whole saga goes on until 2023, what they got the, with it, what they have planned, I'll probably be back to doing that because my art director still talks to me at least twice a month. Okay, so, yeah, so there's still that connection. Yeah, he didn't know what to think about me in the beginning. Because <laughs> here's the weird thing about the job: you don't talk to anybody. Yeah, I don't think I've ever. I forced one small publisher to talk to me on the phone. Other than that, it's done through email. Yep. And you just get your communique of like, here are the details of what we want to provide. Yeah. I, you don't talk to anybody. So I try to emote my feelings by exclamation points. And that's what I'm known <laughs> for with Tom Jankot over at Watsi. I'll put a whole line of exclamation points, you know, just to sell it, how excited I am <laughs> to do these little drawings. <laughs> oh, that's great.
All right. So I know we were talking a lot about um, your experience with D&D and you mentioned your experience with comic books. You love Spider-Man. What would you say is probably your favorite comic book character outside of Spider-Man? That's a tough question. Depends on the era. All right. 90s, see. it was Spawn. Spawn was good. Because I like I, I got to watch that happen yep. with the breakup of the image guys from Marvel and DC and stuff like that. And and watch McFarlane come into his own. Um, so, yeah, 90s, it was Spawn. Um, I also, in the 90s, got into uh, Vertigo. Vertigo yeah. was good. Vertigo. If it wasn't for the downfall of 2000 AD from the censorship in the UK, we would not have Vertigo that we had today. I mean... The Sandman. Yep. Um, Neil other, Gaiman is amazing. Uh, dude, the, yeah, the TV show is fantastic. I haven't seen it yet, but I want to check it out. Um, I got into the, the the rebooted, the original Sandman. And it was kind of confusing because you had two Sandman comics with Vertigo. Mm -hmm. um, I read them both. Um, they, they were uh, Doom Patrol. Yep. Um, yeah, I can't really pick a... Outside of Spider-Man, it's hard because I was a Spider-Man kid since I can remember walking, you know. Um, I liked Mad Magazine. Yeah, Mad was good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I picked those up at the Five and Dime. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was it was just I was always a Spider-Man kid. Um, and I, I think it resonated with me because the, the, the cool thing about Spider-Man, even though he was mainstream, um you know, Captain America was Captain America yep. and stuff like that. But Spider-Man had his flaws mm -hmm. and he had, you know, everything that Stanley put in there of the mechanics of how Peter Parker worked. I mean, like, Spider-Man was cool, but you also had that side of Peter Parker that he had to deal with all this crap. Yep. And, you know, I think that's just what I liked about it, really. Yeah, that's why I always leaned away from things like, you know, Captain America, Superman, like these glorified characters that are perfect people, right? Right. Like, and I, we've broken away from that in the storytelling later as mm -hmm. we go down the line. But in that era, having a humanized character that had real problems, that had real emotions, and there was that moral ambiguity in yep. there, too, that is really important. So for me, like with Spider-Man, I really love like the arcs with like the symbiote suit and Venom. Really amazing because oh, yeah. it, it, Secret it, Wars. Yeah, it introduced that that level of like I'm a good person, but I might be doing something bad, and like how that dynamic works. And it wasn't in one issue. Yeah, it just kept going on, so you could actually witness it happen instead of just going from page one to page thirty two, and then it's just like okay, we're done. No, it just it got spread out. Um, yep. People died too. Yep. I mean, you know, you're talking about family members died. Um, I liked Batman. Yep. Um. I just, it, it, there were so many Batman titles at the time when I was a kid. I was like, I don't even know where to start with this. Yeah, it's very convoluted and complicated. But I kept collecting Creepy and Eerie and Vampirella. Yep. Now, you can't, they were out of print by 86, I think it I was. Think so. Warren Publishing went under. So all you could do is like scour the earth for back issues. So my dad, you know, my dad was a detective. He would not let me take the car out of X amount of area. Mm -hmm. I had to go downtown Detroit to the old bookstores oh yeah so i tell my dad i was going to a friend's house <laughs> <laughs> there i'm taking the family car downtown detroit to these shady shady bookstores that like no windows barely a sign and i'm digging you got porn on one side and creepy and eerie back issues every once in a while <laughs> yep. just stacks and stacks of by the time i was 18 i had every one of the creepy magazines from number one all the way until until warren went under and that was my pride and joy that I, my dad was like, where'd you get those? I was like, I found them. Yeah, I found them. Yeah. Like, it was crazy. Somebody threw them in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a typical teenage answer. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I want to circle back around a little bit. You know, we started talking about your journey with uh, working with Wizards of the Coast and how you got that job. Mm -hmm. Um, just a little bit about kind of like my story and how I got into doing the magic thing is I remember being a kid and there was a hobby store where I grew up in Colorado and my grandfather would take me there because he was into like model trains yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So they had all that. And I remember walking up to this table and there were like these guys sitting around a table with these cards playing this game. And I asked if I could look at them. And the first thing that really grabbed me was the art. Mm -hmm. um, it was super attractive to me because I grew up reading like Tolkien and like all yep. this fantasy stuff, having experience with D&D. &D. And then the next thing I really noticed was like the flavor text that was on the card that was telling a story. Mm -hmm. And so you have this world building now that's coupled with art. And then placed into a mechanic where you're playing a game with it. 
it became a quick obsession for me. Oh yeah. Like absolutely something that, that stuck with me my entire life. Like I've been in and out of it as most people have as an adult growing up, getting a job, yeah. doing all those things. Um, but the art has always been the aesthetic. Now looking at other magic artists, what would you say are some of your favorite pieces of art that you've seen from the game? So here's my story about magic. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was living in that attic, because I have to preface it with this. Yeah. I didn't know about magic. And when I was living in that attic of the farmhouse, there was no house numbers. It was just basically this lady was renting me this attic. You couldn't stand up. And, and then there was my mom's salon was like right next to it. And then there was another farmhouse um, on the other side of the salon. And one day there was a knock at the door. And I was like, well, that's weird. I don't have a door number. It just looks like a service entrance to go up these stairs. So I open it and there's this dude. And I go, hey. He goes, hey. And I go, what's up? And he was like, you want to see my knives? <laughs> That's always the start to a good story. No. <laughs> he goes, well, you want to play magic? And I was like, okay. Yeah, sure. So I he lived is, but... in the house opposite of, of, of the salon. So I went up there. And uh, yeah, he introduced me to magic. It was 90... 96, 97? Okay. No, 97, 98. I don't even know what set that was. But he introduced me to it. And I was like, this is really looking cool um i don't really know if i have a favorite artist because like i never played it again after that mm -hmm. i had i did see his knives they were very nice <laughs> um he also had a nice collection of lizards okay. so the entire apartment had shag carpet and a humidity level that would just you could drink the air yeah it was weird very unpleasant i imagine oh, it was wretched. <laughs> dim lighting and stuff oh it was just but you know i got introduced to it so i didn't play it again until i actually owned a game store um and magic was one of our biggest things and that's when i got into it and my son just went hog wild with it so he's always been my inspiration i love all the i mean i can't really put my finger justine jones mm -hmm. i think is one of my favorites that I got to work with. I'm, I'll just put, I've said that before. Um, I like things I can't figure out. Fair enough. Because it's a different thought process. I know my thought process as an artist, everybody's got their own one. And I've, I've watched, you know, Justine do her, do her sketches and stuff online and everything like that. We've, we've chatted a few times and, but then to see the finished product from, from sketch to ink, I, it just always amazes me. No, because my thought process is, um, I'm, I, I have six projects, six books that need to be done for the month. Now I have to keep my pencils tight, and it's got to look like a mechanical mechanical drawing. It's just there. There can be no loose. The looseness starts in the beginning, but I got to tighten that up because no. I probably won't see those pencils again for another few days. And when I come back to it, if it's way too loose, yeah. I'm like, I don't know That's what right. I was thinking. Yep. I'm not in the moment anymore. So I have to keep really tight pencils just for myself. But yeah, it, I, Justine Jones, fantastic. Um, I think she's one of my favorites. Right. Um, and she did, she did a really cool uh, poster for um, Mastodon. Mm, that mastodon. Oh my god. Yeah. It was, she she posted that. I was like, I wish there was a death metal emoji. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't express Mastodon without, you know, growling a little bit. For but, sure. But anyway, yeah, I, I I like her. Um, as far as the like the older guys, I mean, I never really I appreciated the art, but I never got into like following somebody. Um, like I used to in the eighties, mm -hmm. like Salvo Shema and, and those, but there's a lot of people like artists that I go outside of the genre. Um, Elbrick Durr, um, was one of my favorites as a kid, just studying his wood carvings. Um, I got to see one original Elbrick Durr in, uh, New Orleans at this private art gallery me and my wife walked into and it was just hanging on the wall about that big master non just nondescript just location for it mm -hmm. and i just i it was insane just you're looking at this this was it was made in the 12th century no crying out loud hand carved the detail on it and that's that's where a lot of my line work comes from is albrecht Durr and, and and bernie wrights and it's just um you know you got like those set songs in life that you listen to oh, and yeah. set bands. That's like, okay, that's my, that's my foundation. 
those are my foundation. I always go back to, I appreciate the hell out. Like I don't, I, I like everybody who's been doing, I mean, magic, I think besides Dungeons and Dragons, I think magic, the gathering supersedes or transcends what Dungeons and Dragons did art wise. Um, and I think that's because they, I think, first of all, I think they're the world's largest art dealers or collectors of art. I don't think any other people can, and how many artists do you have working on each set? And yeah, how many sets do you have coming out every, every six months? It's insane to, to even keep up with that, let alone, I don't know how people like follow anybody. <laughs> You're just like, all of this is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. And it's, at a certain point too, you get lost in the oh, absolutely. of it. But that's that's what art's supposed to do. I mean, art's supposed to immerse you into their storyline. Yep. And I'm not looking at a name. I'm looking at like the 360 foot view and on everything. Is is this like engrossing me into the storyline? Absolutely, every time. Yep. Every time. And the the, the art director the art directors there are, are are fantastic. So yeah, it just I mean yeah, I guess Justine Jones is probably my favorite. Awesome. Well, I do have a question for you about a particular piece of art that you created. Mm-hmm. And I know we talked about this last time we met. Um, one of my favorite pieces of art that you did for Adventures in the Forgotten Realms was the Loathsome Troll. Yes. And uh, you had a fun little anecdote about the, the process of, of that drawing and how that came to be and some of the work you had to do on it, if you don't mind sharing. So, no, absolutely. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, and the reason being is because I, I didn't know. They, they gave... And that's all I'm going to preface it. I didn't know. So they give you the dimensions and it's essentially a letterbox, uh, like a video letterbox when a movie would be shot in 16 by nine. Yeah. So it, it, that's what it comes out to. Um, so I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. How much can you fit in there? Right? So I just drew the troll from the rib cage up. I'm like, I don't fit. <laughs> So I sent it in the pencils and Tom was like, yeah, that's really cool. But, um, can you put some legs on them? We need a little more. Yeah. We need, we need some legs, maybe a butt, something, some feet. And stupid me. I was like, oh, okay. What kind of crazy printing process do they have there? You know, <laughs> well, they ended up cropping it for you. And mm-hmm. they just want something to work with and stuff like that. But yeah, it was, um, it was really funny. Can you put some legs on the troll field? <laughs> <laughs> But he was my favorite. Um, he was, I think, he was the one of the first two cards I did. Yeah, because they gave me two to begin, two or three to begin with. And yeah, he was part of that. So, but the skeletons I did were my opportunity to do my ode to Bernie Wrightson. Yep, I can definitely see that inspiration in that art. And I was like, that was 50 hours of inking on those skeletons and then about 20 to 23 hours worth of pencils just to get it anatomically correct, get the the ooze going and and the feel and all that kind of good stuff. Um, Yeah, the skeletons are my favorite, favorite. Those... Those, those guys. And it was funny. I, I, I did the one that got picked. And when I, when I do the cards, I'll do four to five fully rendered samples yep. when I submit it for the pencils. So I did three other variations of the skeletons, but I didn't want those to get printed. I wanted this one, my ode to Bernie Wrightson. No. So I put in some really weird Easter eggs in the first three. They, they were pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> little little deterrence. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, you know, one was uh, Skeletor was in there with the, with the serial numbers <laughs> filed off a little bit. Uh, that's uh, one was Dirk the Daring when he died. Um, one was um, oh, oh, the original Skeletal Warrior from the 80s cartoon Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. And uh, I put each one in there in the first three. And uh, yeah, they were like, hmm. They picked that one. I said, awesome. Yep. <laughs> Just exactly what I wanted. Exactly what I wanted. Uh, I know for me, my favorite pieces of art outside of the troll were the uh, the diamonds. And I know you said that a lot of work went into getting oh, those. Oh, diamonds. Yeah. Tons, tons of hours of, of work getting those to look the way that you wanted. Uh, I think they're beautiful. Thank you. Um, I really enjoy how they look on paper. Um, and they're really evocative of kind of just the nature of what magic is trying to do um for those of you who play quite frequently you know what i'm talking about you need some mana rocks um but can you talk about that process and just kind of the toil that you went through getting those so i didn't understand the magnitude of the diamonds until my 
son read the art brief with me. And he was like, dude, daddy. <laughs> You got the five diamonds. And I was like, okay, why? Well, I got to make them look cool. And so I did a deep dive on geology and diamond cutting and facets and all that kind of stuff. So I could have kind of went the generic route where you got your symbolic triangle bottom diamond with the facets up top and it's a, eh, it's a diamond and some moss. But I wanted each diamond to represent their um, environment. And so went on a whole day deep dive of, of that. And I started pulling out reference photos and, you know, putting over, okay, this is gonna be my moss diamond. This is gonna be my charcoal diamond. So hopefully it translated a little bit that, you know, the charcoal diamonds, very jaggy and stuff like that. So, you know, it was a rough cut stone. Um, whereas the, the, I think the, um, grant, yeah, the, the granite diamond, the, um, White marble diamond, marble diamond, marble diamond. Marble diamond. Um, if you look at it, there's a 45 degree angle that goes into the pillar. So, you know, diamond and pillar are now one, it becomes one solid piece. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was, it was a whole day of deep diving of just looking at diamonds <laughs> and going through it, like, watching videos on how they cut them and why they cut them a certain way and stuff like that. But I only did two two pencils for each diamond um, because I was pretty set on how these were going to look. Um, and if they were going to make any adjustments, that's fine. I didn't want to do a whole bunch. I wanted to stay right on target. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you're going to get two pencils. And it wasn't even a change of the diamond because I knew exactly how the diamonds were going to look, but it was the setting like either the moss or the, like the, the sky diamond. I mean, all that, um, all that line work in the clouds. Yeah. That's again, that was taken from, a I swiped it from Bernie Wrightson when he did the clouds and the Frankenstein um, illustrations um, for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, just the way he did his clouds. I, I can't emulate what, what Bernie did, mm -hmm. but I could swipe a little bit of that style. And those are my favorite clouds I ever did. <laughs> the clouds aren't easy. It's no, black they, and white. they are not. Uh, especially because you want definition yes. in the clouds and it's hard to do that without the Well, color. you want to make it look interesting too and some sort of texture to it. And um I mean, poor Bernie did that with a, you know, pen nib. Yeah. God knows how his lines were that straight without smearing ink somewhere. But anyway. Lots of, lots of, <laughs> lots of practice. But yeah, hopefully it translated well. And and those were, uh, they're crowd pleasers when I go to the go to the cons. Yeah, for sure. So I uh, want to shift gears a little bit and talk about something else that you really enjoy. And that's uh, skateboarding. Mm -hmm. That's something that you're pretty passionate about. Go um, skating after this. I'll, 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 share, I'll, share, I'll share a story with you with my experience with skateboarding, which was very limited. Uh, I remember, I can't, I can't remember if it was for my birthday or some other event. Uh, my mom bought me a skateboard. Okay. And she was like, hey. Wait, what year? Oh, God. This was probably like, I want to say... 91. Okay. So you hit, you had somewhat of a nose yep. and a kick tip. Okay. Yeah. A little bit of concave. And, <laughs> and so she was like, Hey, give me like 20 minutes. We'll go outside. We'll start figuring this out together. Mm -hmm. I said, fuck that. Right. Ran outside and me being a stupid idiot, realizing that the pavement in front of my house was just broken. Oh everywhere. yeah. yeah. I was like, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll get this. Uh -uh. Hopped on the skateboard. <laughs> Two minutes later, <laughs> fell down with my arm behind my back. Oh yeah, full body weight, crushed my wrist, had like oh. bone fragments in my wrist, and that was my one and only experience with skateboarding. I wanted to so bad. I wanted to so bad. Um, so I learned my lesson that I should probably listen to people when they tell me not to do something stupid. <laughs> it didn't translate all the way into my adult life. No, it should. <laughs> no, you should always do something stupid. Always do something <laughs> a little stupid. Um, but I know for you, it's something that you're passionate about. You've been yeah. doing for a really long time. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, um, your experience with it? And then I have a follow-up question that goes along with it. So I've been skating for 38 years. Um, started when I was 10, really 48 this year. Um, I picked it up when I was 10. Um, I wanted to be a, a, a BMX guy okay. when I was 10. And I saw some other kid that I went to school with. He had a cool BMX bike with the big plastic mags in the 80s mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I said, Dad, 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 I want to, I want to be a BMX guy. Well, we lived out in the woods, right? And I was like, I'm not buying one. Where are you going to go? It's a dirt road. You know, you got on whatever. He comes home one night after work. He had found a skateboard while on patrol in a ditch by Toys R Us. He brought that home. He goes, here, play with this. 
He regrets it still to this day. <laughs> uh, is he counting the hospital bills? Yeah, no. no. Well, that that and the um, we'll get the, into the, the cops. lifestyle and everything. Oh, <laughs> yeah. God. Um, so anyway, I had two friends out in the woods, and um, we used to take turns riding this thing, trying to figure it out. Ten years old, I fell in love with it, and then we broke it. And it snapped in half. I mean, this thing had been in a ditch. It's weather worn. So we went to my buddy's house, went into his barn. His dad had a, a table saw. We, it was the jankiest. We found a piece of, I don't know, just a plank of wood. So we tried to make a curve to it. Yeah. We d- drilled some cockeyed holes in there and put the trucks on there and then glued sandpaper on top and then spray painted the top pink because, you know, it was the 80s. Yeah. And that's what we skated with and uh, on this this plank of wood. And then my mom was just like, you you look like an idiot. <laughs> so they went out and got me my first skateboard. And yeah, I fell in love with that. I, I just, I've never stopped 38 years. And um, I've been to court 15 times over it because also from the Satanic Panic, we went into the anti-skateboarding years yep. um, when that became a crime. Um, I can't remember how many counties... I think I still have a warrant up my arrest in um, California. <laughs> I was skating on the boardwalk. I was living in Carlsbad uh, while I was doing comics. And I was skating on the boardwalk. And I hear this, like, beeping noise, like a like almost like a siren, but not really a siren. And I look behind me, and there's a cop on a, on a, a bicycle. That's weird. So I keep skating. He goes, no, pull over. And I was like, you pull over. <laughs> and pop deck up. And I was like, what? He goes, can't skate here. And I was like... Why? It's California. He goes, I got to write you a ticket. I go, for what? He goes, skateboarding's illegal. Still? This is the 90s. <laughs> Didn't we get over this in the 80s? Right. Now, $150 ticket. I go, dude, Tony Hawk lives five miles that way. He goes, well, why don't you go stay, skate at Tony's house? And I said, I would if I could, motherfucker, but I'm stuck here on the boardwalk because I don't know Tony. <laughs> Well, the good news is I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations is up on that. Yeah, but I like say I, I, don't wanna, I can't go to California. Why well, uh bench warrant, skateboard, 150 dollars ticket, and it can't makes go. It, uh, more interesting. <laughs> so, sure. but yeah, I've been in court. I don't know how many times. Um, I broke this shoulder where it came out yep. um, in '89 on a downhill. I broke my right leg four times. I broke every finger and toe at least twice. Cracked my skull. And then at least three to four ribs on my left side. That is probably one of the most painful broken ribs or awful. I, I went through you that. You can't laugh. You can't it's sneeze. Nothing. It's hard to breathe sometimes. Yeah. So I, I feel it on that. That's if you're not bleeding. Right. <laughs> so my follow up when it comes to uh, skateboarding, and I wanted to talk about some stuff that necessarily wasn't about art and more about, you know, just yeah. some of your life stuff. Uh, we were talking about this off, off mic a little bit, but, um, with skateboarding, there also comes a culture of music. Yes. And uh, just want to know, like, what what are some of the things that you're really into when it comes to music that you either previously enjoyed, still enjoy, or had a really good time listening to and that made memories in those moments? So I think it wasn't until the late 90s I stopped listening to new music. Um. I I didn't like what was coming out. I didn't like it. Like I said, you have this this set list that that made you as a person, and that's that's your pillow in life. That's yep. what you lay your head down on. And that's that's your that's your culture, and that's who made you. Um, I mean, yeah, I got into like techno and stuff like that in the ninety early two thousands and stuff like that. But not it wasn't as influential as eighties punk. And if you can sound like 80s punk, I'm at your show. I'll pay the five bucks. We're going. <laughs> um, what are your some, some of your favorites from that era? Uh, the Drunk Engines. Uh, one, I love their backstory. And two, they're, they're timeless. And, and what they did, there was, a, there was a, um, a photographer for Thrasher magazine in the 80s. And his name was uh, Mofo. He was one of the first photographers for Thrasher. And there was no skate rock at the time. There was surf rock. There was, there was, you know, and everybody was, it was all vert guys at the time. So it was all metal and thrash metal at the time. There was no like skate rock. So the photographer Mofo started the drunk engines and what they do, they covered joy division, but, (laughs) but made it punk. And I, I loved all that. Um, And I got introduced to all that music because I lived in the middle of nowhere. There was no record store where you're like, you know, you could go to. Um, 
I got introduced to it through uh, VHS skate tapes, like the Savannah Slamma and all the, the Bones Brigade videos in the 80s and stuff like that, where you were like Mud Honey and, and uh, Dead Kennedys. And just yeah. that's how I got introduced to the music. And but I'll still I mean, you can go out my car right now. I got a whole USB full of <laughs> anything 80s. Uh, Gang Green, um, Agent Orange, um, Thrash, anything. That's just, that's the stuff that moves me. And it's the same thing with art. You know, if you're trying to channel something, you know, I'm doing, I draw Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, 90% of the 12 publishers I work for are third party publishers of 5e. It's Dungeons and Dragons. And that's what it is. So I have every day, I try to channel what would 10 year old Phil want. Yep. And when I'm done with a piece, especially with the pencils, I was like, is it cool? You know, does it look cool? Cause I don't know. My anatomy might be off a little bit. Perspective might be off, but does it look, I take Todd McFarlane's advice on it. Yeah. It's all messed up, but does it look cool? Yeah. And that's the thing. You're not seeking perfection of form. You can't get perfection. It, of form. That's not going to happen. It's your interpretation of, of what it is. And when you try to be too realistic, sometimes you lose that element of the overwhelming fantasy or the surprise or the, yes. you know, the, just the aesthetic of the piece changes with those little flaws and in its imperfections, it can be really beautiful. Neil Adams, uh, who made Batman cool again, um, back in the day, his best line I remember was style is everything you're doing wrong. Yep. And the cool thing about black and white art and why I think I love it so much is you're, your mind fills in the blanks. It's not like a lot of this like hyper realistic 4D video game art. It's like, well, there it is. And it looks cool. And then you move on. And the more you consume of that, your 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 mind's not working anymore. Whereas with and, and I'm not knocking it or anything like that. It is what it is. But black and white art serves a purpose of like now it's it's sparking something in your imagination. It's filling in those blanks. Yeah, you're you're interpreting. Yep. something into it and with any piece of art whether it's you know music or it's uh, an image or a book or, or any of those things leaving room for personal interpretation yep. for it to mean something to you that is different than the next person that looks at it is what makes it special right uh, because if everybody looks at the same thing and they interpret the same thing out of it it's just the thing yep. it serves no further purpose um, so yeah I definitely appreciate when you can look at a piece of art or, or have an experience like that where it really does transform Mm -hmm. uh, the way that you're viewing it. And I know we were, we were talking a little bit about music and I think there's this very interesting intersection between art and music and how they can, mm -hmm. they both inspire each other. Um, so I imagine there's probably plenty of times when you're working in your studio, you got the music blasting while you're working through your process. Is that something that you do? So I start, I start my day, I get up at 6 AM. I start work at 6 30. That's just always been my, with, with, you know, when I went full time, like start work at six thirty, and you stop at five thirty or six o'clock, um, one of the two. Um, in the morning, um, I always leave something to be inked that morning, so that's my warm up. Yep. So from six thirty to eight thirty or nine o'clock, however long it takes, I do one inking. Now my hands loosened up. The rest of the day is either either I got to do some other inkings, but. Um, then I'll jump into pencils. Um, so I work off of three monitors. I have the one in front of me that I'm drawing. I have my reference over here and another monitor. And then my YouTube is over there. Yep. Now in the morning, I start with podcasts. Mm -hmm. And the reason is just because I want it. It's it just conversation. Yep. I don't want anything like moving me yet. I just, I want to concentrate on this. And then I got, you know, white noise, basically, you know, Joe Rogan babbling about something about space aliens or, or ayahuasca or whatever <laughs> in the background. I'm like, uh -huh, okay. So I can concentrate on it. Um, around 1130 <laughs> is when I cut off the podcast and then I get into, um, there's a channel I listen to is called community. So we've talked about magic. We've talked about comic books. We talked about your love for skateboarding. We've talked about music. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, do you have a dream project that you have not done yet? That's something that's really something you really want to work on that you're passionate about starting it next week. All right. Fair enough. Can you share? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm illustrating um, Charles Dickens's um, A Christmas Carol. Okay. And I'm doing it 
in the same style that I did the um, uh, Forgotten Realms in. Okay. So really Bernie Wrightson inspired, black and white. One one thing I miss um, from doing a lot of like the TTRPGs is backgrounds. No. And it's always like a floating monster or a floating guy, you know, who's just going to be a translucent uh, PNG stuck onto a page, yeah, which you, is fine. You lose that depth of field. You lose well, you lose the environment. Yeah. You know, where's this guy live? He doesn't live in the ether. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, and I'm using this project because I want to, you know, delve into architecture. I want to go into landscapes and stuff like that. Cause I was inspired by, you know, Bernie Wrightson's um, Frankenstein. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yeah, I start that next week. I should have it out in a Kickstarter by end of October. It'll be done by November. And it'll be shipping for Christmas. Um, and I'm doing it the way Charles Dickens wanted it. I did a deep dive on him, me and my wife. She's editing the book. And um, he always wanted into a, a red leather book. Okay. But by the time that first came out, there wasn't, there wasn't time. And it's, it's really weird. I, I Tried to do my due diligence as much as possible, but somebody told me that the illustrations have never been redone. Interesting. That's that's a little hard to believe. That's almost. what I yeah. said. And I was like, so I'm going through it and going through it. And it's like, yeah, people might have like done it, but they never did it in book form. No. Second, I couldn't even believe it was in um, the public domain. I'm like, his family didn't want this? This is a huge part of it. That's yeah. why we have Christmas. Right. <laughs> You know, but I always want to do a gothic, um, gothic rendition of because it's it's an a wonderful story. Yeah, and Charles Dickens is an incredible was an incredible writer, and I love his his um, just the way he talks about people and, and class and and all that kind of good. Just it it doesn't it doesn't go out of style. It yep. doesn't um, it transcends. It doesn't age. Yep. And it's, it's one of those stories that's like, you just, I don't know, always resonated with me. I always wanted to do it. And I want, and it gets me away from um, RPGs for a little bit. Yep. Um, where I get to do my own thing. Cause, and I'm quoting um, Todd McFarlane on this. Um, As an illustrator, you're a whore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. No, he's not wrong. People tell you what to draw and then they pay you money. And I love it. But you need your own outlet. If that's what you're doing, what you love, it's it's kind of like a double-edged sword where you're like, wait a second, I, I still have a voice too. And yes, it, it translates into some of the work I do for the RPGs, but I want to be like, this is, this is, and that's, that's where the, the Charles Dickens comes in. And it's like, it's totally removed from RPGs. This is, you know, so that's what I'm doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, any other projects that you have coming up that you can share? Mm-hmm. I know you mentioned that you had some more um, some more cards for Magic. I'm sure that's under wraps, but I just found out when they're coming out, and I, I really, <laughs> really want to talk about no, it. I understand completely. It's huge. It's huge. We can expect, <laughs> we, 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 we can expect something from you in the next year. Uh, early 2020. I thought it was going to be the end of this year. Yep. Um, it got bumped. Um, early 2023. Okay. I have two more cards coming out. Um, I'm pretty sure that they're going to do more with the D and D crossover. I mean, Forgotten Realms is one of the highest selling sets. Um, you know, so it'd be stupid not to. But anyway, um, I actually have a token set coming out next month. Um, it'll be released through my agent Mark Aronowitz, and then also through my website. I'm taking the top ten tokens used. Um, I can send you some images of those. Um, that I have done. I'm really happy with them because I really got to spend some time. Uh, my zombie token, again, is another homage to Bernie Wrightson. <laughs> it is probably the most sinewy Perfect. zombie. <laughs> Perfect. But I got to play the backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's about it. And I have a whole 2023 is already marked out for my Kickstarters of what I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm going to be doing a card set. Um, that's a little bit, it's a, it's a treasure generator, but with a twist Okay. and a NPC generator, but with a twist, a horrible twist, um, that evil DMs would absolutely love. Perfect. Um, 
Yeah, I have a whole uh, 2023. And then there's a monthly magazine uh, thing out in 2023. It's going to be coming out that I want to emulate creepy. Um, I can't really talk about that either because I'm in talks with a couple other people um, of teaming up with them and stuff like that. But yeah, it's there. there's really no end in sight. And it, it's funny because I've only been doing like October 1st will be my four year anniversary of doing this full time. And I've been working for Watsi for three and a half years and out of that four. And it's weird because I never thought I'd, I always thought I'd have a shortage of work. I'd be like, oh, there's going to be some dead time. I'm going to go, you know, get a part time. No, no, it's just. That's good, though. Once you go, you go. And even if it's not for somebody else, like I had to tell half of my publishers last month, I'm not going to be doing any work with them because I have all this other stuff that's, you know, that that's coming up. There's, there's some publishers I was, I kind of messaged on the side and I was like, yeah, disregard yeah. that message. We're, <laughs> we're good. We'll slot you in. Bloat Games, I, I love them. He is so much fun. Eric Bloat is so much fun to work with. And Planet X Games and Le- Legendary Games is so much fun to work with. And they were, I don't know, they, I do color work for them, which is a weird request. <laughs> for so, a black and white artist, yeah. Yeah, and it was also weird being in Barnes & Noble and seeing, you know, my work at Art. I was like, no shit. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's a lot coming up. And, um. And stuff like that. You can go to philstoneillustrations.com and see it all. All right. Awesome. So, yeah, check out his website. Uh, some really cool stuff there. Some awesome things that you can purchase. Uh, where else can they find you on social media? Um, Instagram. I see, I have a love hate relationship with, with, with social media. Um, Facebook is always my go to um, just because I have the, uh, the biggest audience there. Um, Instagram, I'm at Philstone Art. Um, I don't really post a lot on there. I don't have time. I just, <laughs> I usually post in the morning and then I'm done. For the, I just don't check it or anything. Like, unless I got a Kickstarter going. That's about it. Also, you know, but other than that, I, I have this weird thing with Instagram. And I, I tell that to all aspiring artists too. I'm like, do not rely on social media. No. Because all you have to do is watch somebody scroll on their phone all day. And all of a sudden, just imagine your art on there and it's one thumb scroll away from not being seen. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah. Stay away from social media when that comes to that. All right. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you again, Phil, for coming out and talking to us today. I really do appreciate it. It's been yeah. a fun time. Had a great conversation. And we'll see all of you next time.